So there we go. We are going to start a st series on Philippians, so that's why we read Jonah. Does that make any sense? <clears throat> kind of. Um, but I love that passage in Jonah. It is so mind-blowing. God sends Jonah, go to Nineveh. He says, nope, I don't want to do that. And um, he, he runs off, and then the Lord brings him back to Assyria. Now, Assyria was super evil, and they were the arch enemy of Israel. And Jonah knows that. Now, Jonah is so nationalistic. He hates the Assyrians. He's so pro-Israel, he can't see God's love for the Assyrians, right? And uh, it comes around here, and then um, he preaches probably half-heartedly, you know what I mean, to the, to the Assyrians, and they repent. And then, and then they repent, and look what Jonah says. It says, or, God relented from the disaster. It displeased Jonah that God forgave them of their sins. And he said, oh, Lord, isn't this what I said would happen when I was in my country? That's why I ran away to Tarshish, for I know that you're gracious, gracious and merciful, slow to anger. And I, I remember reading this. My mind is exploding. I'm like, it doesn't make any sense unless you are so nationalistic that your nationhood takes precedence over God's love. Isn't that interesting? And so um, we, are, we are not far from that. And so... Um, what, what's going to go on in Philippians today, we're going to intersect with that, and we're going to see that um, the gospel is for every ethnicity, every nation, and every social stratus, okay? Stratus. So that's, that's where we're going, and that's, that's the, um, the introduction to that. So um, anyway, we are going through our series here. <laughs> and... Uh, 2022, we're making disciples and connecting in unity. So as we study Philippians, we're going to keep that theme rolling of connecting in unity. All right. And the next one, we have like glitches today, but that's okay. Anyway, the books of the Bible, uh, the New Testament anyway. Um, we've got Gospels. Now, Gospels are that, that history of the life of Jesus, Acts. And then uh, in the middle, you have Paul's epistles. And the reason they're organized the way they are in your Bibles is that the big ones come before the small ones. And the letters written to churches come before letters written to people. That's it, all right? Romans is first, Philippians, or I mean uh, Philemon is, is last. And then to the right, you've got general epistles, and um, then finally Revelation. But we're going to zero in on Philippians right there. That's kind of what we're doing. And um, yeah, there's, there's Philippians. And we are going to see servanthood, joy, 15 times joy is mentioned, teamwork, encouragement, joyful giving, and um, unity, big, big themes in the, um, in the book, all right? And so um, basically what happens here, we're, we're, we're shifting to a New Testament situation. Paul, on his second missionary journey, establishes the church. He runs around and does more stuff. He gets in trouble. He gets arrested. And then from prison he writes this letter philippians okay so we're going to walk you through walk you through a little history here in the book of acts you know the book of acts covers the spread of the gospel from jerusalem to judea samaria and to the ends of the earth to rome okay and so it's just like like a um, a big big domino thing so you've got um acts 13 and 14 paul takes the first missionary journey he's up in galatia and then the second missionary journey Acts 16, and we're going to be in Acts 16 today, but uh, this is where he bumps into Philippi, and he founds the church, or he establishes the church at Philippi on the second missionary journey, and um, then during that time, he gets this vision, some guy in Macedonia, we have here, says, hey, come help us, and so he goes and helps them, and then we have the second missionary, or the third missionary journey, Acts 19 and 20, he, all, he goes back to Philippi, and um, then he gets arrested in um, Caesarea, and from Caesarea, he's shipped off to Rome, and then he writes Philippians from Rome. So that's kind of, but here's, here's where Philippi is. That's, that's 800 miles between the two, and uh, that will come into play later on. So that's basically just a quick short story of what's going on and how we got there. But the context is Paul is in jail when he writes this letter, okay? That's, that's the whole context. And so um, while he's in jail... In Rome, he receives a gift from the church in Philippi, 800 miles away. And, and um, a guy named Epaphroditus, if you're newly married and you're expecting a child, 
consider that name. That's great. Epaphroditus. And, um, and this, this guy journeys 800 miles with a financial gift and a note that says, we're praying for you. Have a nice day, right? 800 miles, and that's a brutal, t- brutal, brutal trip. It's like from here to Austin, Texas, or here to Columbus, Ohio, or if you're really smart, it's here to the Utah border, because that's where we should all go. Anyway, um, seriously, he, he, the trip was so hard, he got sick. He either got sick on the way to Rome, or once he was there, he got sick, but he, was, he almost died for the work of the gospel, and Paul says he's super valuable, and Paul writes a letter, a thank you letter, to the Philippians and says, says Epaphroditus, take this back. So now he's got to go 800 miles back with this thank you note. And um, that's basically the, the, the broad story of what's going on here. Uh, but unity and joy in all circumstances. That's going to be a theme I'm going to be bringing up here. Unity and joy in all circumstances is what we see in the gospel. As Jesus lived in joyful unity with the Father, so we should live in joyful unity with one another. Okay? Jesus is the example. So in, in this, this book, chapter 2, we'll get into this later, but, but there, Jesus is sort of like the hub of a wheel. Everything in Philippians revolves around who Jesus is, what he did, how he humbled himself, and so he is our example, all right? So we're going to take a look here at two things today. I've already mentioned this, but he visits the church at Philippi, and he establishes it, and then uh, 12 years later or so, he l- writes a letter from prison. So, let's go to the first point and take a look at this, uh, Acts 16, um, chapter 16, first couple verses say that they were going through Philippi. Now, let me just pause there and say, Philippi, it, it's a town, okay, this can, can be confusing, but Philippians is the name of a letter written to people who live in the town of Philippi. They're a Roman colony, and um, a lot of them are ex-military. And so this city is uh, pretty, pretty important. But it says here in this verse, 16, uh, start, let's go down to verse tw- um, 12. From there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. So it's a leading city. Uh, as, a, as a Roman colony, they pay fewer taxes. They get privileges and freedom. They get to vote. They get to elect. And um, actually, Philippi, the town, had 730 square miles of territory around it with many smaller villages that they were um, in charge of or responsible for and enjoyed the fruits, uh, f- fruits thereof. Anyway, so um, it says here in the text, too, that he went out, in verse 13, on the Sabbath day, they went outside to the gate to the river where they were supposed there was a place of prayer. And they sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. So he's looking for a synagogue. A place of prayer is a synagogue. There isn't a synagogue in Philippi. It's a Roman outpost. It's a Roman colony full of ex-Roman military people. There's no synagogue. Jewish law said that in order to build a synagogue, you had to at at least have 10 Jewish men. There's no synagogue, so there's a super, super small population of Jewish people here in Philippi. Okay, that's just what we kind of conclude. So he, there's no synagogue, so he's like, well, where, where do people pray? Oh, they go down by the river. A mile and a half away, he walks a mile and a half to the river. This is where the Jews pray, I guess, and he just finds there's no men, just some women. Now, you've got to understand, Paul, in his background as a Pharisee, he would frequently pray like our Pharisees did. They thanked God they were not Gentiles, slaves, or women. And now here Paul is preaching to women. Isn't it neat how the gospel changed his heart? Because as a Pharisee, he would just walk right by them. Anyway, so that's, that's kind of neat. But he finds these women, he starts preaching, and one of them is this woman named Lydia, and she's a big deal. It comes up later in the text. So, um, but basically, the, the culture of Philippi, the town, ancient, ancient, it goes back hundreds of years, and they had this brutal history of human sacrifice and uh, worshiping Bacchus, the wine god, and um, until the Greek culture, Hellenism swept in, and the Greek culture replaced that culture, and then you have the worship of Apollo, and um, then the Roman culture came in, and so now you have Latin and Greek. But now the Roman culture, I'm going to get to this a couple times today. Repetition is good. I'm going to get to this a couple times today. Repetition is good. 
Anyway, I couldn't resist that. But um, the, Roman, the Roman Empire had this, tr- this uh, tendency. They would conquer areas, and the people whom they conquered, the Senate would approve the religion of that area. They're now in the Roman Empire. You can worship, like over here in this section, you can worship your religion because we just conquered you as Rome, but you cannot push your weird religion on anybody else. And the people over here, we just conquered you, right? You can, you can worship whatever gods you want to, but you cannot push that on anybody else in the Roman Empire. And, and they, Rome conquered a ton of people. There are estimates there's up to 40 different religious systems in the Roman Empire approved that people could choose from. But you cannot proselytize. Interesting, isn't it? And so um, that's kind of the background of that. And so there were legal and illegal religions. If you remember back to when we did Mark, well, I went through this a little bit. Uh, the Senate would approve some religions, and they were legal. The illegal ones, um, well, the, they, they had significant freedom to, to worship and do what they want, as long as they didn't, one of two things, as long, well, three really, but two apply here. As long as they didn't promote public discord or anti-Roman sentiments, or excessive debauchery, which is not an issue with our New Testament friends, right? Anyway, um, except in Corinth, but that's another sermon. So anyway, um, we have public discord we need to look out for and anti-Roman sentiments, all right? The first Christians were so closely associated with the Jewish religious thing that the culture looked at the Jews or the Christians and said, well, you're, you're, you're protected because you're part of the Jewish religion, all right? But as, as time goes on and as Christianity separates from the Jewish system, and especially in AD 70 when the uh, temple was destroyed, Christianity is no longer re- recognized as part of the Jewish religion. It's a separate thing. And as I've read before, uh, they're very suspicious of these meetings, these, these associations. They didn't call them churches. The, 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 the state called them associations. And um, they did, the, Rome didn't know what to do with this church thing. Was it a political entity, a social thing? Was it a club? But they were very nervous that these associations would become political groups. And uh, just about 30 years after the temple was destroyed in, in uh, the year 70, um, Trajan, the Ro- emperor of Rome, Rome, said, when people gather together for a common purpose, whatever name we may give them, whatever function we may assign them, they soon become political groups. So they're just nervous that whoever's meeting together, you're going to cause trouble. Remember, we're, we're looking for promoting public discord. That's the Roman label that they're cautious about, and, and the Christians are meeting are, are going to be under that, um, that suspicion. Plus, you've got the, the Christians are no longer calling Caesar Lord. They're calling Jesus Lord. Well, that is anti Roman anti-sentiment. I mean, that's a problem. So you've got a, a lot of undercurrents here of instability, threats, and question marks about Christianity. Okay? So we come to the church at Philippi, and we see three amazing things that happen in the church at Philippi. Three significant things. In fact, Paul spends more time explaining um, his evangelistic trip to Philippi than um, any other city on the second and third journey, okay? It was his first European city that he goes to. But why would the Philippians need to know these three stories here? What's behind it? And here's the question that I'll ask a couple times. What happens to a community when they believe the gospel is only for one part of society, when the gospel is only for one group? Division. And that's what he's going to be driving at here, okay? So the conversion of Lydia, Acts chapter 16, verse 14. So he went to, there's no synagogue, he goes to the river, there's no men, he talks to women. One who heard us, she was a woman named Lydia from the town, uh, city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. So at this point, she's a Jewish proselyte worshiping God, the Old Testament God in the Old Testament way. And the Lord opened her heart to pay attention, that is to believe, what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, so she's already believed, she's a believer, her household as well, she went home and told them, and they believe individually in Jesus. She urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful in the Lord, come to my house and stay. And so in this culture, you remember all these these dozens of religious pockets of people, they all had a, uh, a sponsor, somebody 
would sponsor them not only with money, but with space and resources. And Lydia seems to be a sponsor for the Christians in this town. So all these other weird political association groups, religious groups would have a similar sponsor. So in this culture, she was wealthy. She's purple. Um, Purple's a big deal in this culture. It comes from the, uh, the mollusk. It's a, it's a shell, a seashell, that they would crush and dye and make this dye. It, it was very hard to get enough dye to, to dye cloth, so it was very expensive. In fact, Rome, check this out, they had a law specifying who could and who could not wear the color purple. Yeah, and, and you think you're the only ones that are struggling with government mandates, right? Anyway, okay, so anyway, we'll... Um, move on here. So, so Lydia is converted. Now, she is from the upper class, wealthy, sophisticated, right? Um, industrious, nice. She's smart. She's capable. And so the gospel applies to the upper class. W what happens if a, a group of people think the gospel only applies to the upper class? Division. Interesting. So, um, the exorcism of the demon girl, okay? This is interesting. She, um, she re would represent the lower class. And so you go to chapter 16, verse 16. As we're going to the place of prayer, we're met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination. It's, it's literally the spirit of Python. Python is connected with the Roman god of Apollo. But anyway, um, they brought her owners much gain or money by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And she kept doing this for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned aside, said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her, and it came out at that very hour. I wish I had time to get into, and I wish I knew all the answers behind, what, what does it mean that, you know, um, why is she telling everybody this guy's preaching the truth if there's a demon in her? I think perhaps just to annoy and, and whatever, and it, and it worked. But anyway, um, she represents the lower class, the problematic, the despised, the outcast, the stressful, the just get away from me people, okay? Those kind of people the gospel affects. The gospel is for those kind of people, all right? And then the, the people who were making money with this girl from their fortune telling drag them before the city and watch the language they use in verse 20. They brought them to the magistrates, the Roman magistrates. They said, these men are Jews. They are disturbing our city, right? Public discord. And they're advocating customs that are not lawful for, for us as Roman citizens to accept. That's a criminal charge, okay? Um, you cannot invite me to believe what you believe. In Rome. And actually, I was talking to Nick. Nick and Alex is in Rome that we're thrilled to support. And I just said, just like 20 minutes ago, I'm like, hey, I'm studying this. Isn't it weird that in this culture they said, you're welcome, part of the empire. You can believe whatever you want to, but you cannot proselytize and really talk to someone else and invite them and say, no, you need to believe what I believe. And, and they'll talk about this later, but it's, it seems to be somewhat similar today in Rome. Isn't that crazy? And, and actually here, too. It must be um, something in the water. Anyway, um, okay, so they're charged with pu public discord and introducing a foreign religion. Actually, in Acts 18.2, the Christians had already been expelled from Rome. So there is a lot of anti-Semitism going on here. And so I just, I'm just i trying to paint a picture. So if you envision a mental movie, it's not just all happy. and it, It's stressful. You're afraid someone's going to find out. You're afraid someone's going to see you meeting in a prayer group. And, and are they going to label me as um, a criminal? And, and um, there was actually a death sentence if you're uh, an association that's not approved by the government and you're, uh, you're, you're believed to be threatening Rome. So there's a lot of tension here. Um, okay, so, verse 22, the crowd joined in, look at the verbs, attacking them, the magistrates tore off their garments, beat them with rods, inflicted many blows on them, threw them into prison, and then I love this next phrase, and ordered the jailer, take care of them safely. <laughs> what, what in the world, right? It says, yeah, having ordered the jailer to keep them safely, anyway. Um, I think what they mean is don't let them escape because they're a threat. That's what he means, but it's just kind of, you can read it funny that way, right? Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison, fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, we read this and we're like, uh, well, I guess I should keep going on here. And what do they do? Um, 
about midnight, they were singing and praying and hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And we're like, oh, yes, I would sing too in prison. Yes, I would. And I'm like, yeah, okay, I, uh, maybe you would. My first inclination is, I've been wronged. You can't do that. This is, this is injustice. Because isn't that our culture? I have rights. I can do this. And we do have a culture where we do have freedoms, and we need to leverage them and not just fall down. But, but my inner heart's cry is not first rejoice. It's first, ugh. I'm just being honest. Maybe y'all are way ahead of me on that spiritual growth thing. But anyway, I'm just saying this is interesting that they are being afflicted. There's injustice, and they are singing praise to God, and the prisoners are listening to them. They've never heard this before. They've never seen anybody else in the stocks at midnight praying and singing. This is clearly a, a spiritual power thing, and then an earthquake happens. And the prisoners do not escape. Isn't it interesting? I just wonder. Give me a time machine and I'm going to go here and be a fly on the wall and, and look with a flashlight because it's dark, I guess, because the guy had to go get a torch. But anyway, um, the prisoners probably assumed this earthquake was the, the result of some, you know, like these guys are, are, are spiritual whatever men and this earthquake is something they did. So they're like, we're, either they're afraid we're not going to go anywhere or they have been talking about Jesus and the gospel and they just understood this is a spiritual thing. Anyway, the point is the prisoners do not leave. And um, so they've been attacked. They throw them in prison. And the point, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that insisting on our rights doesn't lead to unity. When you step on my toes, if I respond with my rights, that, that's not a path to unity. If you're married and your spouse offends you and makes you upset for bigger little reasons, if you, if you leverage and you, uh, you respond with your rights, it doesn't lead to harmony and unity, right? Isn't it interesting? And so um, they were stripped, thrown, beaten, and um, actually two months later, he's in Thessalonica, and he mentions this. He's like, hey, when we're at Philippi, we have already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi. We had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel in much uh, conflict. And so that's what, um, that's what he was doing there. So that is interesting how um, arguing for our rights doesn't really help us find unity. The third story here is the Philippian jailer that's converted. So we've already seen the upper class with Lydia, the lower class with, with a, a slave girl, and now here, the Philippian jailer, he represents the, the middle class, the Roman soldier who was violent, opportunistic, uh, brutal, shrewd, strong, and um, he knows how to hurt you. And this, the gospel affects them too. Verse 25, they were praying and singing, and the prisoners were listening to them. There's an earthquake. Um, everyone's bonds were unfastened, verse 26 says. Verse 27, when the jailer awoke, saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword. He was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners had escaped. The reason he's doing that is because Roman law said if you're a Roman soldier in charge of these people and they escape you, then whatever their sentence was is now your sentence. And so he thought he was going to have to be killed and tortured. And so, But Paul quickly cries out, verse 28, we're all here. No one's escaped, and that blows his mind. And so he says, get the lights, and then he replies, what must I do to be saved? Now, that word saved can mean deliver. It's possible. He just simply means, you know, I'm in trouble here because the, the gates are busted, and, and you guys are spiritual voodoo men, and I, I don't want to offend you, so deliver me from whatever that is. Or they've been preaching Jesus, and he, he understands it's a spiritual offer, all right? Um, one of the two, probably the latter, since that's where the text goes. But anyway... What must I do to be saved? And they say believe. Believe in Jesus. Pretty simple. It's the only condition, right? Goes home and tells his family, and look at verse 33. Look at the transforming power of the gospel, okay? Check this out. Listen, the gospel transforms you. Transformation does not gospel you. You know what I mean? I mean, we don't transform ourselves in order to be the gospel. We believe the gospel, and Jesus transforms us. He took them to his home. He washed their wounds. They were baptized, all his family, 
They brought them up into the house. They set food before them, rejoiced. Different verbs than beat with robs, rods and, and strip naked, right? And so um, he, this Roman soldier washing them, feeding them, rejoicing with them, not afraid these guys are going to run away. He is renewed, right? So at, at, this is all happening in the town of Philippi, where 12 years later, he's going to write a letter to this town where these things happen. The gospel is for every layer of society, every ethnicity, every nation, every social class, the gospel. And unity, if you believe the gospel is only for one segment, you're going to end up with discord and division. And that is not what Paul wants. And so now we zoom fast forward. We've just skipped over the third missionary journey. He's been arrested. And now he's in Rome. Okay. Fast 12 years of your life. And so um, he sends them a letter. Now, here's a little trick I want to help you remember. Philippians is, is one of the prison epistles because he wrote it in prison. And so here's how to remember that. Every prisoner causes problems. Every prisoner, E-P-C-P, -P, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, every prisoner causes problems. Get it? Got it. Good. Test on Friday. Now, here's the deal. Um, if you look at Paul's epistles and you, you count the words, which we have computers to do this for. I don't encourage you to do that on your own time. But anyway, um, in, in this world, the, the average Greco-Roman private letter was 90 words. Greco-Roman longer letter, like Cicero and people would write long, 200 words. Now, the average piece of parchment, so pretend this is a piece of parchment here, it would hold about 200 words. Right? And so most letters were a page, 200 words long. Uh, Paul, have you, have you read any works of Paul? Are they, are they longer than 200 words? Yeah, check this out. Romans, 7,000 words. Philippians, 1,629. That is just mind-blowing. So what I'm trying to impress upon you is that Paul just creates an entire new literary thing in his culture. I mean, he's writing way longer than people are used to. It's like, they're like, it just keeps going. Like, whoa, whoa it just keeps, okay? And he doesn't write with chapters and verses. He just writes, okay? No one speaks with chapters and verses. But anyway, just trying to help you understand that, that Paul literally moves, the, um, moves it down, down the field there in terms of the length and very sophisticated writing. We'll get into this next week with, with how he does that. But he writes a letter thanking them for their gift, talking about Epaphroditus, and um, then he starts to touch on there's a problem in the church. It, it's, it's really like Galatians, he just lowers the boom. You foolish Galatians, who has, who has bewitched you? And it's not that tone here. The tone here is much more warm, and, and seven times he says, my, my beloved brethren, or one of the two, and and uh, this is just very friendly and soft. This church doesn't have a lot of problems. But still they face that threat of these Judaizers, and so this is what we're getting into. So there's two groups that are opposing Paul's teaching. Wherever Paul goes, there's opposition because he's preaching the gospel, right? So in chapter 1, um, you've got some confused preachers. It's not hard to find confused preachers, right? And when I was in seminary, we used to look at TV at midnight, and there were a lot of confused preachers asking for my money. And they said they were going to give me a prayer cloth. I don't know what that was, but I think they're confused preachers. Anyway, so um, here are these preachers that says in verse 15, some preach Christ from envy and rivalry. Now just stop right there. Can you get your head around that? You're preaching from envy and rivalry. What? What does that even mean? I mean, well, are you paying attention to what you're preaching, right? I mean, how, how, do you, how do you not see the discord there? And probably what's going on here, in, in this area, there were people who were like, I'm a big shot, I'm a big deal, and, and look at me, don't look at Jesus, look at me. And then, and then Paul shows up, and their eyes go from them to Paul, and they're like, oh, no, I'm not popular. So now... You know, um, Paul's in jail, so now I'm going to go out and I'm going to be a bigger deal, and Paul's going to be upset because I'm going to take their eyes off Paul back onto me. And Paul's like, you guys, man, are, are you 13? Anyway, are you immature? That's what I meant by that. But um, so, so there's confused preachers. Some preach Christ from love, and some preach Christ from selfish ambition, and his response is priceless. Whatever, I'm just happy that Christ has preached. 
And, and there, I'm like, I'm not sure I would respond that way. I'm like, I'm like, well, if they're doing it for the wrong motive, they're probably not doing it well. The message is probably butchered and unclear. So anyway, but he still says, Christ, I think he's trusting the Spirit of God. If they're pushing out the Word of God, the Spirit of God is going to use the Word of God, all right? Anyway, um, here's another lesson. They're theologically sound in the fact that they, they know God and Jesus, but, but, but they're jerks. You can be theologically on target, but be a jerk. Isn't that interesting, right? Um, their motivation was, was questionable. Anyway, chapter 1, you've got these confused preachers. Chapter 3, it's a whole different group down here. Chapter 3, he says there's people who want to, um, he says they're, they're dogs, evil workers, and mutilators of the flesh, um, look out for the dogs, look out for these evildoers, he says. Now, these are the, the Jews who believe you have to do the law to be saved and also to continue in your religious walk. And that is the problem in chapter 3. We'll get to this in a, in a month or so, but I'm just trying to give you the overview. So the, the issue, every, every time Paul went and preached the gospel, forgiveness based on Jesus alone and freeing you up from works, the Judaizers just freaked out. They spent their whole life measuring and, and doing this and working and, and performing. And so to hear that that doesn't matter, they, they just couldn't go there. So Paul believed a couple things that just, just freaked them right out of their skin. One was that Gentiles could be saved. The, the Pharisees believe that's not even possible. Um, two, when they're saved, they don't have to follow the law any longer. Well, that's just not going to fly with the Pharisees. And then they believe the law Paul believed the law was fulfilled by the Spirit, so they don't have to fulfill the law. And so the whole law is the issue, and by that I mean the Old Testament, the expectations, and, and all this. And I'm excited to get into this book because our motivation, remember, as Christians, motivation is everything. Here we got preachers preaching with the wrong motivation, okay? So um, what's our motivation to do the right thing? said it from the, uh, up here today, she used the word response, and that is our big thing here at this church. We respond to the grace of God. We see the grace of God. We respond to it. He loves first. We love second. I don't love him first, and then he responds to my love. It's the other way around, right? So we want to get that straight. So here are a couple things about the law. What is the purpose of the law? Scripture says it is to reveal sin. We know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be silenced, the whole world held accountable to God. So we're held accountable. And again in 7-7, um, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, here we go, through the law we become conscious of sin. John, don't take a cookie. I'm like five. Well, all of a sudden I realize, ooh, I should not do that, but now I want to do that. Before the prohibition came, I was fine. You, know, you, you can relate to that, right? You know, the sign, don't do this. Well, why? What's, what's on the other side of that? I think I need to know. Okay, you've been there. Um, to lead us to Christ. The second thing, what then was the purpose of the law? I love scripture. It just tells us. It was added because of transgressions until Jesus, the seed to whom the promise referred, had come. And down later on, it says, before faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up, again, until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. And that is a very freeing truth. It's also very scary because you realize you can't control people with spiritual abuse of power, right? And sometimes we want to do that. And so Paul recognizes in the book of Romans several times, he's like, here's the grace of God, and you can't lock it down, and you can't make this and do that. And, and then he's like, well, should we just go crazy with, with um, sin then, that grace can't increase? He's like, no, that's not what I'm talking about. So there's always, a, when you're talking about real grace, there's always a, a possibility of abusing it. And why don't we abuse it? Because of love, response of love, okay? So um, let, me, let me put it this way. How many of you this morning, it's 1020, uh, you wake up and you look in the mirror, 
looks like most of you looked in the mirror. Now, how many of you grab the mirror off the wall, you get a hammer and a pry bar, and you bust the mirror off the wall, and, and you take the mirror and, well, I'm not better yet. Why don't you do that? Okay, what's the purpose of a mirror? It's to reflect your condition. Is the purpose of a mirror to fix your condition? No. You see your condition, you're like, whoa, I got work to do. So you reach for other tools designed to deal with your condition. The law is, is designed to reflect your condition. It was never designed to fix your condition. It reflects your inadequate, your hostile to God. You need to go to Jesus. That's what this is saying. Until you find Jesus, once you find Jesus, uh, you're done with the law. It has served its purpose. It doesn't mean you're, you're going to go crazy against the law and be a weird lawbreaker because love has renewed you. It's a beautiful truth, okay? I just love that. And that changes the fundamental way we, we live life, okay? So these are the truths that he is talking to the church at Philippi about. Now, this, this church, I've already said, it's a healthy church, right? It was, it was the church, I think it might have been Paul's favorite church. It gave him the least trouble, you know what I mean? They're always, they're always down the middle and, and doing well. A couple observations about this church. There's a bunch of Gentiles there, ex-Roman colony, a bunch of significant women there. We've got Lydia, we've got that slave girl, we've got Yodia and Syntyche who, who had some disagreement. <laughs> Dude, wouldn't you hate it if you're in the Bible, and the only reason you're in the Bible is because you got in an argument, and you're like, Paul, really? That was just one time. You're going to put me in the Bible for one argument? Anyway, we'll, we'll clear that up when we get to heaven. Like, where's Yodia? Like, what's going on here? Anyway, they were also generous. They gave sacrificially out of, out of the, they're not rich, but they gave. And they, you know, they, hey, Epaphroditus, take this and go 800 miles and tell Paul we're on his side. They're loyal. They're hospitable. Fifty years after this letter was written, Ignatius was escorted, uh, um, escorted. <laughs> he was escorted to Rome, probably to be killed, and on the way, he writes that the church at Philippi encouraged him. Isn't that interesting? Polycarp wrote 60 years after Paul's last visit that the church in Philippi was standing strong. So this church is strong right down the middle. And I would believe that Paul's instruction and his, his laying out the gospel is for every class of society. If one group of people think the gospel is only for them, you're going to be divided. And they seem to get their head around that and welcome the low class, the upper class, the former Roman soldier class. And they all worship Jesus together. And um, that is a win for everybody. All right. So as Jesus served in joyful unity with the Father, we should serve one another in joyful unity together, right? That's kind of the picture that we see here. How do we get there? We get there by gospel thinking, right? Um, the gospel is not limited to Jews. The gospel is power to forgive. It's for every level of society. Um, it produces transformation. Transformation does not produce the gospel. The gospel produces transformation, right? Um, if you look at your life and you think, I don't see the degree of spiritual maturity I would like, don't just buy a WWJD bracelet, read the Gospels. Get, in, get your head around who Jesus is, what he's doing, why he's doing it, and, and um, he changes us from the inside out. We don't want to change from the outside in. Um, the Gospel will always be opposed. There's, there's weird stuff going on inside in this church sometimes, confused preachers, and there's pressures from the outside, and that's to be expected, and the Gospel leads to unity. So this is, this is what we're saying. Gospel thinking leads to unity. Unity begins when someone else's issues are more important than my own. All right? He'll say that in a couple chapters. And here are my questions to us today as we wrap up. Do you limit the Gospel? Are there people of various ethnic backgrounds, income, or social levels, levels that you dismiss? Are these people like, now, now, think of political parties. Let's just get real. They can be so charged, and we can be so quick to go to the enemy language. Because like Jonah and Assyria, you are threatening the very fabric of our society. If you had your way, you will wipe out everything we hold dear. And Jonah's like, no. And God's like, 
Yes. God's love is for every, whatever side of the aisle you're on, God's love is for everybody. How are you doing with, do you have any certain classes of people that you, right? All of a sudden it's like, what, but, 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 okay. Anyway, I won't play the Holy Spirit, I'll just move on. The gospel produces transformation. Who has God placed in your sphere of influence that, that you could serve? Just, you know, uh, as we close here, think about these questions and, uh, and we'll move on. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace and your kindness. Thank you for Paul. Thank you for the people, the women at Philippi serving you so well. Thank you that the church endured well, endured long. We want to be lovers of you. We want to respond well to your truth, your kindness. So thank you for, for this series on Philippians. We pray that we as a church would grow in unity and our relationships Monday through Friday would be enhanced because of your love as we rub shoulders with a lot of people, some of whom we just don't have much in common with, but um, we were all designed in your image, designed to love and walk with you. Amen.